Do you want to have kids? If so, when and how many? It's a big decision. They may be small bundles of joy, but they can cost a fortune. As people weigh up the pros and cons of procreating, fewer children are being born, especially in the rich world. And in the long term, this can mean fewer young workers to support the elderly. So, is it worth having kids? I went back and forth a lot in the beginning. Good job, buddy. A lot of thought that went into weighing the options of both having kids and not having kids. Jessica and her husband Andre live in Houston, Texas, with their two-year-old son, Michael. The day he was born, um, I was overcome with a lot of emotion, happiness, just joy. It's crazy. So having children makes people happy, right? In the short term, yes. But in the long term, not necessarily. According to academics, it's likely Jessica was experiencing what's known as a happiness bump. Mother's happiness levels rise in the years leading up to giving birth. But that's where they peak. And within a few years of return to the level they were before the kid was born. We've been studying men and women in couples with and without children. And we see that uh, their levels of happiness and life satisfaction, mental health and loneliness are quite similar. That's quite consistent across a lot of different countries. Some factors do affect people's happiness, such as their income and whether they are single parents. Parents in countries with stronger welfare systems also report higher levels of happiness. But all in all, there isn't much difference between the life satisfaction of parents and people without kids. While there might be moments during the day that are filled with happiness, the more typical experience is that being together with your children can be quite distressful. It also takes up much of your time and energy. It brings with it a lot of worries. Let's do downward facing dog together, ready? Ooh. Ooh. I thought motherhood would be, you know, you see all the stuff in the movies. I really thought that it would be this beautiful time where you'd have a great relationship with your kids. Yeah but also, you know, a little bit of hard work too that I don't think I understood before uh, we decided to have Michael. About 80% of parents in America say parenting is enjoyable, but almost 30% also admit it's stressful all or most of the time. If children won't make you happy, why have them? For most of history, people had lots of children which made financial sense because kids could work in the fields and look after their parents in old age. But as societies have grown richer, there has been a reduction in procreation. We've seen a change in why people have children and the economic incentives to having children. So as we have more countries offering pensions, older adults are less reliant on their adult children to provide for them in their older years. And at the same time, we see more women getting higher levels of education, being employed. We also see a change in attitudes, a move towards secularization, so less importance of religion, a rise in feminism, a rise in women's rights, and childhood extends because we need to educate our children longer. So the costs of raising children go up. And kids can be costly. The costs start even before birth. Fertility treatment, for those who need it, is expensive. And in some countries, giving birth in a hospital can cost thousands of dollars. Then there's food, clothes, nappies, toys, baby carriers, and prams. <laughs> The Economist has calculated that a typical American family can expect to spend almost $300,000 raising a child to the age of 17. Factor in college tuition and it rises to over $400,000. For Jessica and Andre in Houston, those costs are about to go up even more. They're expecting their second child. Um. Oh no! 
No, let's not touch that. The financial implications are big. Children are expensive. You are full of words. What are you saying? I mean, there's less stuff to buy, you know, just because we already have, uh, you know, a car seat and all that stuff um, from Michael. We are saving for education and all that stuff for two kids instead of one. The strain on Jessica's and Andre's budget is not helped by the fact that America is the only rich country that doesn't have nationwide statutory paid parental leave. Instead, federal policy is just 12 weeks of unpaid leave. But there are so many restrictions, only 56% of workers are eligible and many feel they can't afford to sacrifice their salary for this long. At the time when Michael was born, um, I was the primary breadwinner for our family. I did not get paid maternity leave. That definitely played a role in terms of deciding how long of a maternity leave to take. And after two months, um, uh, I went back to work full time. It was definitely hard leaving Michael after two months just because that's around the time when kids start to become a little bit more interactive. Babies start to smile, so I almost felt like I was missing out on something by going back to work so soon. Statutory parental leave in rich countries varies greatly. In Japan, parents are given about a year of paid parental leave each of which half is paid at about two-thirds of their normal salary. In Finland, parents are given about 14 months of paid leave to share. They're also entitled to take further childcare leave up until their child is three. In Britain, a mother's job is guaranteed for a year, but only six weeks are paid at almost full salary. A further 33 weeks are paid but at a much lower level. It means Britain has one of the least generous leave policies in Europe, which can make it harder for some Brits to balance their budgets. What do you like mixing into pancakes? Chocolate eggs. Chocolate eggs. <laughs> Faye lives in the south of England with her husband, Matt, and their three-year-old daughter, Eloise. Ready, last one? Do you want to do it with me? Yeah. It's gone the wrong way. I took 12 months maternity leave, so the last three months of maternity leave were unpaid, unfortunately, um, but it was something that we sat down and worked out that we could achieve financially with my husband doing extra overtime. Even before those final three months, there isn't a huge amount of pay for maternity leave. We just had to be financially very conscious of what we were spending. So we can't still really... can do it! Yeah, you can still find all the edge bits first, can't you? And those challenges don't end when the parent goes back to work. When we were looking at our finances, we didn't really factor in nursery costs. When we then looked at childcare costs, it was huge. Um, some months she was going two days a week, and some months it was more than our mortgage. The costs are sometimes crippling. In six OECD countries, couples earning the average wage spend over 20% of their salaries on childcare. Get some nursery clothes out, honey. Britain has the joint second most expensive childcare in the world. We have thought about having another child. Unfortunately, the cost side of things does have a big impact. I could give up work, but I don't want to rely on benefits or income support. We want to be self-sufficient. If that means not having another child, because of the financial implications, it's upsetting because we would love to have another one. Okay, it's, on. it's not just in Britain. A survey of young American adults found that of those who said they have or expect to have fewer children than they'd like, 64% cited childcare costs as a reason. Hi, I'm Anna and I directed this film. If you're enjoying watching it, you might be interested to know that Economist subscribers get access to a wealth of global analysis on every conceivable topic. You can read it, you can listen to it, you can even be part of it at live webinars. For the best deal on a subscription, click on the link. And now on with the film. It's not just the direct costs. Having kids can also affect how much mothers earn. Most parents experience a loss in take-home pay when they take parental leave. Men in heterosexual relationships experience a very small short-term dip 
But for women, the dip is much bigger and their earnings rarely recover. This is known as the motherhood penalty. Jolie Brearley is the founder of the British charity Pregnant Then Screwed. The motherhood penalty is the pay differential between mothers and other types of employees. It's essentially a procreation pay gap. When you have a baby, the way that our parental leave system functions, it encourages women to take long periods of time out of the workforce. It doesn't encourage men to do the same. In most heterosexual couples, the father will earn the most money. So when women look to return to work, they look at the cost of childcare and they compare it to their own salary. And in most cases, it doesn't add up. They then start to make career sacrifices. They look to return part-time, if at all, or they change jobs to something that's more suitable so that they can continue to do the lion's share of the caring and the unpaid labour. And so all of this starts to hack away at their income and their career progression. In Britain, mothers are three times more likely to work part-time than fathers. Following the pandemic, the shift to remote working has made it easier for some parents to work more flexibly, but not all jobs allow this. My work are very flexible, but it's a juggle. And at times, just trying to work out my working pattern to be able to make it worthwhile me actually working and financially contributing to the house. I work office hours and my husband does shift work. I'm only three hours off full time so legally and technically I am a part time worker. It's the most amount that I can work that I then don't have to spend all of it on childcare. <laughs> Motherhood penalties vary across the world. One study looks at motherhood penalties in six rich countries. It finds that Germany, a country where a lot of women work part-time, had the worst penalty with a 61% drop in long-run earnings, while Denmark and Sweden had the smallest but still sizeable penalties. That's partly because Scandinavian countries have longer and better paid paternity leave. We've seen as a result of that in Sweden that many more dads are taking time out of the workplace to care for their children. And as a result of that, we've seen that the gender pay gap is much smaller, the share of the unpaid labour is far more equal. Over the last 50 or 60 years, we've seen big changes in gender dynamics and in countries where we've seen that men have become more equal partners with women in raising kids we see that fertility rates are actually higher than in similar countries where men aren't contributing as much to child rearing and housework. Take Japan, where women spend far more time on household chores and childcare than men do, making it much harder for women to have a career and raise children, despite having some of the most generous maternity and paternity leave on the planet which might explain why Japan has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world. In nearly all rich industrialized countries, fertility rates have fallen below 2.1 children per woman, the rate needed to maintain a stable population. And on a macroeconomic level, that can cause problems. So if fertility falls low enough, then there are potentially not enough workers in the next generation. In the long term, it means a change in the labor force, how many workers are available, how much money those workers are paying into pension programs, into taxes. Most industrialized countries are pretty far from that level, although there are a few that have seen really dramatic reductions in fertility. More open immigration policies could help, but few countries seem willing to consider them. So if falling birth rates can cause economic disruption, should governments intervene? We want to be careful that governments aren't doing things that are coercive or that unduly restrict people's freedom to have the kind of families and the number of children that they want. But there is a role for government for supporting families with children. And in many countries, there is certainly a lot more room for investment from the public sector. But it's not just about the economics, although that's part of it, but it's also about cultural ideals, 
It's about the influence of religion. It's about the compatibility of motherhood and careers. And it's about gender dynamics. Choosing to have children is a big decision, governed by deep emotions, as well as practicalities. More generous parental leave, cheaper childcare, and flexibility at work might make the decision a bit easier. But despite the challenges of parenthood, those who do choose to have babies rarely regret it. Being a mom has come with its own struggles and um, redefining your own image to yourself. But uh, yeah, at the end of the day, um, life is just fuller with, with a new person in your family. It's the hardest thing that you ever do, becoming a parent, but it's the most rewarding. I've never experienced such extreme levels of joy and happiness and elation and pride as I have since I've had children. For more of our economic and social analysis, click on the link. Thanks so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe.